The Kansas Libertarian Party held their 2022 state convention here in Wichita this weekend. One of the primary purposes for the event was the election of candidates who will represent their party on the November 2022 general election ballot. The Libertarian Party, many of you may not know this, it's the third largest political party in the U.S. However, Libertarians have consistently failed to win elections, which begs the question, why are the Libertarians struggling to resonate with voters? Joining us now to talk about the event, the Libertarian Party platform, is Spike Cohen. He was a featured speaker at the event. He was also the 2020 Libertarian Party candidate for vice president, coming in third place in the 2020 election. Spike, thanks for joining us this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. I appreciate it, man. Well, no, it's really cool. I, I've had people in the past who said, you know, they think that I'm a libertarian, or and I definitely have libertarian tendencies. Mm-hmm. I just door knocked with my mother for Ronald Reagan's gubernatorial reelection, so yes. I kind of have to be a Republican. It's just sort of in the blood. She, she Was he a Republican then? Oh, shut up. You see, now, yes, I, yeah, I know where you're going, smart Alec. I know where you're going. So for my listeners, but you know what? I'm, I'm the only one allowed to be a smart Alec. I, said, I caught myself. Uh, so for my listeners who are unfamiliar with the Libertarian Party, give us just a kind of a basic idea. I mean, I'll go into some of the more specific sure, sure, platform, sure. but what basically what's a Libertarian? A nutshell, yeah. yeah. So Libertarians, long and short of it is Libertarians believe that you should have autonomy over yourself your life, your rights, your body, your labor, and the product of your labor, which is your property. And we believe that when uh, someone tries to take from you, when they try to hurt you, when they try to uh, violate your rights, violate your property, try to steal from you against your will, uh, not only we consider that an act of aggression, and not only is that bad from a moral standpoint, it's, it's what we tell children. You don't hurt people. You don't take their stuff. It also doesn't work. If I can take from you whenever I want to, if I can order you around and I don't have to prove that any of that has any value, then things aren't going to work well because I I don't have to demonstrate that what I'm having you do or what I'm making you do or what I'm taking from you is going to be in your best interest other than if you don't go along with it, I'm going to hurt you. And so that's what we have now. It's a system that's run on on coercion and sort of this threat of harm if you don't comply. It's not a good system. There's too little, too much power in the hands of too few people. And libertarians want to dismantle that and put the power back in the hands of the people. And when you say when somebody takes from you, you libertarians include the government. Including in the government. Okay. And I, I agree. There's def- I mean, We've talked. Before the show, we mm-hmm. talked about civil asset forfeiture. Absolutely. The great example of yes. the government taking. Uh, I reviewed the Kansas Libertarian website, which mm-hmm. is lpks.org, if anybody wants to check it out. Uh, in the statement of principles, and by and large, just as an overarching statement, by and large, I think your party platform and the Republican Party platform, which I've actually helped write in the past, mm-hmm. They're not too far apart on a lot of issues. Oh, there's a lot um, of overlap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we hold that all adults are capable of deciding what's best for themselves, their families, their communities. Recognize that all individuals have the right to exercise sole dominion. This is kind of what you were saying. Mm-hmm. We have the right to live in whatever they choose. So, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but the question is, so long as they don't do okay, – we have the right to live in whatever manner they choose so long as they do not forcibly – or forcibly interfere with the equal rights of others to live mm-hmm. in whatever manner they choose. Yeah, that sounds a little anarchistic to me. I mean, it's basically free for all on what I want to do on my property. They, you, you would have no limits then on what guy wants to put up a forty foot tower that whatever to worship the Church of the Spaghetti Monster in and in a homeowners association. You would support that's his right. Well, no, so if you're in a homeowners association, you, that's a private agreement okay. between home, homeowners under a, a master deed that everyone has agreed to, either when it was developed, when it was made, or when you buy into it. So no, I mean it, 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 an HOA or any kind of private organization where people have voluntarily agreed gotcha. to the standards. The problem is when government is forcing something on you, you don't really get to agree to that. You know, we're, we're told by the progressive left all the time there's a social contract and you signed it oh, the yeah. moment you were oh, born, yeah, yeah, which yeah. of course wouldn't apply to anything else, right? You have right. to have established and informed consent, except for the social contract, that, right. which is when you were born in this very moment and we own you. Um, and no, and only we, we, after you're born. And only after yeah, you're right. born, right. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> at, at the very moment of birth, you suddenly have signed a contract, <laughs> uh, fully informed of, of such. But um, what we believe is that when it's being enforced upon you, if there is to be a government, Okay, And if it is to be just, and this is straight out of the Declaration of Independence, a government, if it is to be tolerable, it only should be protecting your life, your rights, and your property, and defending it and affirming it. And that's it. 
It shouldn't be telling you how to live. It shouldn't be taking from you against your will. It shouldn't be forcing things on you that you don't want or forcing your will on others. Like and vaccines or mask mandates. Any of that. Okay. And, and, and if it does, we have the right to alter or abolish it. And see, that, I think, if you look at it in that, way, in that regard, it's very old constitutional. It's very... The, it's the, actually pre-constitutional. Right. Well, yeah, it's revolutionary yes, it is, stuff, yes. It is very core of what the... And, and I yep. think you've seen... As our government has grown, as yep. power does, oh, yeah. it tends to corrupt. Um, the, let's see, the, the first principle that you guys had on the Kansas platform is mm-hmm. the right to life. Yep. Accordingly, we support the prohibition of the initiation of force against others. Does mm-hmm. the right to life for libertarians include uh, the unborn? Does yeah. It, uh, so, what? Well, no, uh, I was saying, yeah, to to the question. The first part. So, uh, the is actually quite a debate that is in the libertarian movement and in the party about, well, when does personhood begin? Because personhood would begin when personhood begins, then that would be when as a person, you have the right to the same thing you would have as, as you or I as grown adults. Um, there are some that believe it happens at conception. There are others that believe that it happens at birth. There are some that believe it happens when the, the heartbeat begins or when there's brain right. activity. Same there's, debate. there's all sorts of debate and, 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 and a lack of, of a solid consensus on when personhood begins and therefore when they have those rights. I can tell you, if we're, if we're talking about abortion, I, have a, a, I consider myself pro-life. I think that abortions are a gruesome and usually regrettable practice. I think it would make much more sense for us to focus on providing support to those who are considering uh, aborting for economic reasons for financial reasons, which is what the vast majority of women get them for when they're asked. Um, I think that the war on drugs has brought us more drugs. The war on terrorism has brought us more terrorism. The war on poverty has brought us more poverty. I don't want a war on abortion. And that's, that's, uh, that's my take on it. That's a fair statement. That's a, and we'll get to the drug part, trust me. Um, <laughs> the, right the drug to, question. The, the, the drug question. The right of liberty and speech. Uh, again, uh, a core principle I think both parties would agree on. Um, and I know it, you, you guys uh, oppose all attempts to government by government to abridge the freedom of speech in the mm. press. Right now, there's a lot going on with you know the issues of CRT being yep. taught yep. in schools, age appropriate you know textbooks, yep. Yep. things you know gender and sex being taught to kindergartners. Yep. Doesn't government have a role to play in that though to protect? You know, a child, a, a four-year-old from in a school being taught about gender when a parent doesn't want that to happen. I trust parents more than I do politicians. Well, I agree. And, I, and, I, and the I, problem and is, these a lot of cases, the schools are cutting the parent out. Well, and that is a problem. It's also, and and the core problem there is that government really should not be involved in education. Uh, government schools. Uh, if they were not always from the beginning, they certainly have become government indoctrination centers. And so what you have now is you have these like factions of parents deciding what every student is going to be taught. And I, it, that's a direct result of, of democratizing and governmentalizing education. It should have never happened. Now, to your question, I think instead of having government say this shouldn't be allowed to be taught or this should be required to be taught, I think instead what you do is you either get government out of education entirely or you allow whatever money is being spent on a child to be assigned to that child and for the, the parents, parent to decide yes. where they're being taught. Yeah. And then that no longer is a problem because it's the parent deciding what that library says by virtue of sending their children to the school with the libraries that they agree with and that align with their value. There are going to be some people that they want their children to be taught yep. CRT and intersectional feminism and, and, and gender fluidity and all these things. And that's if that's, that's what they want, yep. then that's the I right. Agree. And I if agree. you want your children to be taught a, a, a traditional religious values and and, you know, a gender binary and, and you know, and whatever they want to be taught, uh, then they should have the right to be able to do that. And if for the vast majority of, of p- parents who are probably somewhere in between those those two poles, they should be allowed to decide what their children are being taught. More importantly, by having the money assigned to the child, then there's more accountability for the educators. And, you know, they aren't just getting endless money, even if they don't do well. I uh, we're talking, by the way, with Spike Cohen, who was the 2020 Libertarian candidate for vice president. I guess it's the first time I've had a vice presidential candidate on the show. <laughs> vice presidential I, bronze medalist. I, I, I no have less. had a I have had a presidential candidate on the show, and we had Newt Gingrich on, but I haven't had wow. a uh, haven't haven't had a, a vice presidential candidate. Awesome. On. Uh, reviewing, you know, some of these other platform issues. There's a lot we can talk about. Mm-hmm. I, and what I want to do is take a quick break, and sure. then we'll come back and we'll talk the drug question. The lightning round. We'll, we'll break out the brownies and the Doritos, okay? <laughs> Stick around. We're, uh, you're listening to The John Whitmer Show on 98.7 and 1330 KNSS, Wichita's number one talk. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> <sighs> Goodbye. 
Goodbye, bench press. Adios, squat rack. Fare thee well, kettlebell. Hey, Kellen, need a spot? No, Jake from State Farm. I'm just saying goodbye to my pricey gym membership. What? Don't give up what you love. State Farm has options like insuring your home and ride with great rates on both. Nice. Hey, can I buy you a protein shake or a granola bar? Or... For surprisingly great rates, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Steve and Ted Mornings. Here's one out of New York for you. New York Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin has been indicted and arrested on corruption charges. Prosecutors say when Benjamin was a New York State Senator, he took bribes in the form of campaign contributions from a real estate developer in exchange for approving a $50,000 state grant. Uh, Benjamin is pleading not guilty and his campaign denies any wrongdoing. Shocking. There are corrupt officials in Albany. Steve and Ted in the morning on 98.7 and 1330 KNSS. Coast to Coast AM. They're great for insomniacs. Long-term insomniacs. We're here when you can't sleep. Because I would hear voices. Ghost activity in my home. She saw him come out of the wall, across the floor, and under the baseboard. And here if you never sleep again. And then I jolted awake. I mean, I ran out of the house 2 o'clock in the morning, and I wouldn't go back in the house. That scared the hell out of me. Coast to Coast AM. I sleep now with three nightlights. I'm going to have to sleep my life on tonight. Overnights on 98.7 and 1330 KNSS. Your phone call is welcome at 869-1330. This is the John Whitmer Show on 98.7 and 1330 KNSS. Welcome back to the John Whitmer Show on 98.7 and 1330 KNSS, sponsored by Wink Hartman and the Hartman Group of Companies. We're going to get right to it. With us still is Spike Cohen, who was uh, the Libertarian Party's mm-hmm. 2020 candidate for vice president. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let, let me establish first off that I think the two parties would find common ground on gun rights. It seems like we're almost in unison on on gun. gun at least gun in rights. theory, yes. I, I'd like to see Republican politicians practice what they preach at the federal level. But yes, yeah, I, yes. that's a fair statement. Yes, yeah. I, there, but in, in, hands in, off our guns. In word, a, if not in deed, yes, would be a yeah. pretty straightforward libertarian concept. Yeah, Donald Trump saying "take the guns first, due process later" would certainly not fall yeah, in well, with the libertarian. That I, I could see that. Um, <laughs> one personal liberty area where I think the two parties may diverge probably Mm -hmm. the most Mm -hmm. is regarding the legalization of drugs. The Kansas Libertarian Party platform calls for an end to the prohibition of any drug. Yes. I mean, it's one thing. Right now, Kansas is Mm -hmm. considering legalizing marijuana for medical use. Mm -hmm. But that platform calls for the legalizing crack cocaine, meth, and fentanyl. All of them. <laughs> I mean, how do you yes. uh, how do you justify that? So the assumption there obviously is we want everyone doing drugs, right? Or, or no, or, or, I don't think you yeah. want them. Yeah, but you want people to be able to if they want to. Here's my perspective on that. Fentanyl. John. I was uh, I was a drug addict for the better part of ten years. I've been clean for sixteen years now. Congrats! I That's am no fan easy. of drugs at all. I don't drink alcohol. I don't drink coffee at this point. I I I live a very very clean life. I saw, we've all saw what happened 100 years ago with the war on alcohol. The exact same the th- same thing that's happening with the war on drugs. And let's be clear, alcohol can be a deadly drug. Alcohol is technically a poison. Oh, yeah. Um, and what happened, you know, they were going to solve their society's ails by, by banning alcohol. But what did it do? It created a massive, and all the massive yeah. cartel. Those cartels turned around, paid off the, the police to look the, the other way. They paid off the politicians to keep the cartel going by keeping prohibition going. It corrupted government at all levels, not just on that. Uh, you saw this divide between the police and the public, where the public thought, up until that point, they thought the police were there to enforce you know, protection on them, but now increasingly they were there to c- collect revenue uh, from people that were uh, in- involved in the alcohol trade. Uh, there was a, it, the uh, uh, product itself was less safe uh, uh, either from the fact that the people that were producing it uh, weren't exactly committed to uh, to you know safe production practices. These are literal cartels. We actually, in some cases, had the government poisoning the supply of alcohol uh, in order to. to I know. So I'm not disagreeing with any of this. This is but what has happened is legalizing with legalizing meth and crack and the other. Yep. I, I just got to say that that's I mean, it's one thing to say marijuana. So even though I think there's there, well, there's no, medical evidence says yeah, yeah, there's yeah. downsides to marijuana use. But 
I mean, we're talking a whole nother level when you're, you want to legalize. You're going to find very few people. PCP. In, you're going to find very few people, including those that are taking them, that believe that those are good or beneficial things. So I, why I, legalize what, all drugs? Because we need to look at why people are getting addicted to heroin and to meth. And it often is because of the war on drugs. I have talked to countless people who were But reached, is legalizing it the solution? It is the solution of being able to get them care instead of criminalizing them and killing the cartels for good. Instead of having them sponsored by the CIA and the DEA to compete against the Chinese and Russian sponsored cartels in Central and South America, which incidentally is leading to the political turmoil and violence that's causing right. the which surge on the border. So it, it, this is is it, I think part of the problem is that there is a perception that there is a way to end all addiction. And there no, isn't. Yeah, but no. what we can do is we can treat addiction like what it is, a health problem, instead of putting people in prison for being addicts, which, by the way, the vast majority of drug dealers are actually people that are selling part of their supply to be able to afford their own. Yeah. That's, that's documented. They're not getting kingpins. They're getting addicts who need help. Yeah. And instead of giving them help, we give them a criminal record, which incidentally costs exponentially more to the taxpayer and to our society that getting them help would get. Now, we're not proposing taxpayer-funded rehab or anything like that. We're proposing allowing people to help those that are in need instead of them being criminalized at a massive cost to the taxpayer, massive cost to our safety with criminal gang violence to protect turf uh, for, for drugs. If someone is going to be using meth, if someone is going to be using fentanyl, if someone is going to be using heroin, I would like them to be able to get it as safely as possible without relying on cartels and gangs for it. That's fair. That's a fair. And, you know, we could probably go round and around. And don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. not necessarily opposed to the general concepts or yep. the reasoning. Well, no, I'm not opposed to it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not opposed to the general reasoning behind it. Yep. It's just, I don't know if that's the right solution. It's not going to be a utopia. I'm not going no, to pretend that. True. I'm not going to pretend it's a utopia. I am going to say that it would kill the cartels. It would kill the gang violence. It would allow a lot of people who, uh, incidentally, we're talking about cannabis and other things. You mean other, marijuana? Uh, <laughs> I marijuana can call it, I refuse to call it cannabis. I'm not going to play their words. Whatever it is. <laughs> cannabis, marijuana, whatever you want to call it. We can talk about that. Uh, that's actually been one of the, that and Kratom and some of these other things that are either illegal or heavily regulated are some of the most effective ways to get people off of opiates and other it's hard true. drugs. Let me ask you this. I want to get to this before I, because we're coming up on my top of the hour break. The Libertarian Party as a whole, I mean, over 7,300 senators and representatives currently in state legislatures mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. the country, none are libertarians. Uh, one is. Actually, one. Is there one We now? do have one. We have finally one. have one. Okay, well, uh, my, my figures were one out of 7,400. Yes. Um, you know, Ross Perot, mm -hmm. he refused to exit that race. He wasn't libertarian, but he was a third-party candidate. And many believe, myself included, that led to Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. You had Greg Orman here the last cycle around that took 10,000 votes away, probably away from Chris Kobach, mm -hmm. which gave us Laura Kelly. Here locally, we are stuck with a radical liberal Democrat in Mayor Whipple because Lindy Wells stayed in that race. So what do you say to folks who worry that you know, the Libertarian Party is taking away votes from Republicans who we've established – share the, I, I would say, of the majority or a bulk of your platform sh is paired with the Republican Party platform. Sure. So aren't you taking away votes and, and enabling Democrats by running? Well, so I do want to correct one thing. Libertarians have won hundreds of races. We do have hundreds of elected officials. They're mostly at the local level. Fair. At the state level and at the federal level, it's it's pretty slim pickings right now. So at least for there, what at least for now, what the Libertarian Party is representing is a massive vote of no confidence. Now, you were mentioning Greg. I, I Greg, get but, that. Well, hold on, well, hold on. Because, we're making... Okay, but listen, in Kansas, a deep red state... If 10,000 votes was enough to get Chris, is it Chris Kobach, to not get reelected, what no, do you want to bet that was, maybe he wasn't representing the traditional conservative he, values of he, Kansas? Chris Kobach had his own issues, exactly. and I get that, but he would have been far better than Laura Kelly. And in, in here in Wichita, we had that third party, Lindy Wells, and that gave us Brandon Whipple for four years. And I just, my, my worry is that couldn't, your, couldn't libertarians try and merge with the Republican Party and make changes from within. Well, there are some doing that. So there are libertarians in, uh, it's called the Republican Liberty Caucus. So like, you, you think of Rand Paul, you think of Thomas yes. Massey. That's happening. And they're and by effective. The way, and, and there's been some effect there. I mean, and, you got to keep I'm in not, mind. I'm not I'm against not, them gotta, doing that either. one minute break, so, yeah. but you got to keep in mind, I mean, the <laughs> the libertarians on the third, on your, on your presidential ticket last time, the guy who came in third was a guy with a boot on his head. So, I yes. mean, it's, you know, I want you to be viable, 
But I, I just am afraid libertarians are spoilers, and I'd almost wish they'd, they'd kind of join. Before I, before we end, I want to make sure people, it's lpks.org. It is. If Donald Trump hadn't run up $7 trillion in debt while uh, amassing gun control more than the last four presidents behind him and working with the CDC to implement uh, 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 lockdowns and, and mandates, maybe he would have gotten more libertarian votes. I don't probably. know what to tell you. He probably could have. You listen to the John Whitmer Show. We'll be back right after this.